Stardate JD2456531.50 Personal Log 002 Aldebaran can be seen a little below the moon tonight in the constellation of Taurus. The light from this star, which forms the bull's eye, traveled 393.9 trillion miles for its sparkle to be reflected in your eye tonight. It left for this journey 67 years ago, so what you are seeing is like a snapshot of this star from near the end of World War II, amongst billions of stars also representing various moments in the lifetime of our universe, a sky filled with infinite time machines. The concept of the time machine was coined by H.G. Wells in his 1895 book of the same name. By traveling in a vehicle in which the operator could select a date, it was possible for said driver to travel back and forth in time. In the book's epilogue, the story's narrator writes, I, for my own part, cannot think that these latter days of weak experiment, fragmentary theory, and mutual discord are indeed man's culminating time. I say for my own part, he, I know, referring to the time traveler, thought but cheerlessly of the advancement of mankind, and saw it in the growing pile of civilization, only a foolish heaping that must inevitably fall back upon and destroy its makers in the end. If that is so, it remains for us to live as though it were not. The book is an early representation of the science fiction motif of the dying earth. In this frequently used literary trope, the planet has been exhausted of resources and is near the end of its existence, but inasmuch presents an opportunity for humankind to redeem itself before it's too late. Only at the zero hour can we see the folly of our ways and take corrective action. But where does this kind of thought experiment ultimately lead? In Catastrophism, the Apocalyptic Politics of Collapse and Rebirth, the authors argue for a close look at the contemporary prevalence of catastrophic thinking and challenge the conviction that it is only out of the ruins that we will be restored to a healthy and balanced planet and way of life. Writer Sasha Lilly breaks down the problems with this trajectory from both right and left-wing political positions when she writes, Radical expectations of collapse frequently lead to the twin dangers of adventurism, the ill-conceived actions of the few, and political quietism, the inaction that flows from awaiting the inexorable laws of history to put an end to capitalism. In both, class struggle is sidelined. The prognosis that the system will keel over originates, at least theoretically, in an impoverished and mechanical understanding of capitalism. Antonio Gramsci, whose prison notebooks ruminated on the experience of revolutionary defeat in Italy, emphatically decried mechanistic politics. Gramsci believed that while capitalism might enter economic crises, they are not life-threatening. At best, they offer a more favorable terrain for the dissemination of socialist ideologies, but were most likely to be the vehicle through which capitalism restructured itself. The work of anti-capitalist political organizing, as long and arduous as it is, cannot be replaced by the shortcut of an irrevocable system failure or by plucking revolution out of thin air. The left is dominated by this tendency to equate crisis with the prospect of revolution, the idea that the masses will be pushed to a tipping point. This is a dangerous proposition and not what it appears to be. First of all, it assumes that the worse things get, the better they are for starting the revolution. This historically led to an acceptance of and even an instigation of worsening conditions for the most vulnerable people. Second, it assumes that the natural reaction to misery is to take steps towards collective empowerment, which has not historically been the case. Instead, individual workers may take action to empower themselves based on whatever position they can, be it race, gender, or other privileges. The assumption that misery leads to collective empowerment may have initially been tied to a short-sighted reading of Marx and Engels, who wrote in the Communist Manifesto that the despair of the proletariat under capitalism would intensify to the point of insurgency. The following year, they expanded on this point and brought greater clarity to the process in waging capital. Here they give the example of the labor force that is growing, but in which workers rise up not because they are unhappy, but because they are unsatisfied. They see the improvement of society while congruent to the improvements in their labor conditions are not improving proportional to their own small allowances, and that the wealthy are improving at a vastly disparate pace. This, Lilly argues, is backed up by the two most important periods of social strike that occurred in the 20th century, both of which happened during periods of economic expansion in which radical workers forced employers to raise wages and shorten the work week. 
Fueled by the economic prosperity of the time, the revolutions then quieted during the recessions that followed. So what of our time machine? Predicated on a dying planet, it presents an opportunity for personal apathy rather than for the eager anticipation of our impending advancement by our own collective actions. We must move optimistically out of the time machine and into the simultaneity of all things. This is not the singular view witnessed by Walter Benjamin's Angel of History. Benjamin wrote, Where we perceive a chain of events, he sees one single catastrophe that keeps piling ruin upon ruin and hurls it in front of his feet. The angel would like to stay, awaken the dead, and make whole what has been smashed. But a storm is blowing from paradise. It has got caught in his wings with such violence that the angel can no longer close them. The storm irresistibly propels him into the future, to which his back is turned, while the pile of debris before him grows skyward. This storm is what we call progress. While Benjamin's ninth thesis captures catastrophism in its most poetic wonder, it neither propels us forward nor turns us back, but leaves us in this moment anticipating the failure of our collective efforts in the face of the hierarchy of the Kronos in respect to the cosmos, while on the horizon billions of stars, indeed billions of futures past, await us together. <laughs>